Hello and welcome. My name is James Roy and today I'm speaking with my friend and colleague Deborah Abella. Deb is one of the best known and hardest working writers for young people in Australia and has written 26 books that have been published all over the world and have won multiple awards. These books include the Max Remy Super Spy series, the Jasper Zamet books, a number of cranky books about kids in the future dealing with the effects of climate change, books like New City and Grimsden. She also wrote Teresa, a new Australian, which is a book about a young refugee coming to Australia from Malta during the Second World War. And even books about spelling bees, of all things. She's also written picture books. She started out in the creative world as a producer of a kids' TV show called Cheese TV and was once, wait, no, twice, thrown in jail in Africa. And in this masterclass, Deb and I are talking about hunting and gathering ideas. Okay, so I'm talking to Deb Abella. How are you, Deb? I'm good, thanks, James. How are you? Look, I'm okay in these troubled times. Um, I know. It's kind of like I'm okay in world-adjusted times, like considering where we're at, I'm travelling okay. You're travelling okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, and we've, we're sort of doing this weird thing with holding phones up to ears and getting microphones in the right places and uh, all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think we'll, we'll get through it. It's Brave New World. It's... Um, yeah, it's a Monday morning and the whole world is trying to use Zoom so they can keep, keep going with their businesses and things, I guess. Yeah, I think so. As we are trying to do, as, as Westwards and people like yourself are trying to do as well. So, um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, anyway. All right, so um, this is a little masterclass, mini masterclass on hunting and gathering for ideas. And I thought of you because you've written, what, 26 books and they, yeah. they cover everything from spies to uh, global warming to the whole planet getting flooded because of global warming and and uh, what else what are, what are the books I've written books about um, spelling bees a, and, that's and right people coming to Australia during the war and all those sorts of things that's right yeah so you've got a lot of ideas and that's the point I guess I'm making and I want to know right. how, how you go how you hunt and gather for ideas have you got a few pointers you can give uh, listeners about how you uh, go about hunting and gathering ideas because that's what writers yeah. are always doing yeah and I think even when writers are in the middle of a project I mean you know you, you're always kind of got your half an eye open on other things and you're always you know well, I don't know I, I wake up in the morning and I think yeah that's how I'm going to solve that problem in this novel I haven't even written yet that's still a vague idea. So um, I think my, my first thing would be just to really be open to ideas even these kind of you know, ill-formed, little, vague, fluffy ideas that come to you, um, but they'll have a spark in them. And even if you think, well, I don't know what to do with that idea yet, put it somewhere. So whether you have a notebook, whether you have files on your computer, I've got like a, a lot of different files with sometimes really just a sentence that struck me some, somehow that I thought this could actually be a novel one day or it could be a picture book. Um, so I think just be really open to ideas. That would be my, my, my first kind of suggestion. And um, also go with your heart. When an idea really sparks with you and you don't know enough about it yet, you don't know enough about that character or that world, just trust that your heart has been kind of flooded by it and that it, 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 if not now, that at some time in the future, if you go back to it, um, it might actually develop into something really quite substantial and quite amazing. And, and go exploring, like um, read widely, read lots of stuff, listen to lots of stuff, um, go walking, go walking with your iPod, uh, with your earphones not in. <laughs> um, I've just been really aware in the last few years you know, the podcasts are so exciting, of course, because you learn lots of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but it's really important to daydream. It's really important to sit on that bus, maybe not at the moment, but in normal times, sit on the bus, look out the window, take stuff in, just stare, um, and go for a walk down the park, down the street, whatever, um, unplugged, completely unplugged, and just look and listen. Yeah. I think we've forgotten how to do that a little bit, and I think it's really important. Well, a couple of years ago when I was lucky enough to be, um, I, was, I was loaned a house in, um, in uh, Konstanz in Germany to finish a book yeah. and I was there for a week. I didn't know the language terribly well. I could kind of get by but not, not really. And I had a, I have a really nice camera so I was going everywhere taking these, you know, amazing photos. But then, well, I, th I felt that amazing. But then one, um, 
one day I <laughs> went out and got halfway down the block and realised I'd forgotten to take my camera. And I thought, oh, I'll just keep walking. So I just kept walking without yeah. my camera. And yeah. I saw lots of different things that I hadn't seen when I was looking for a photo op suddenly. And so I made a point of every second day not taking my camera and the whole world just opened up. You see it differently when you're not trying to frame it for mm -hmm. that great Instagram shot. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such a great story to illustrate exactly what I'm trying to say. Just stop trying to record the world, just be in it. And, and that's when really lovely times kind of happen. I mean, the other thing is to set up times where you are with other creators. Um, I'm in a writer's group called Squibby and, uh, and we deliberately set um, activities up and events up where we, we are exploring ideas. And I went a few years ago, we had something called a sketch and scribble at Taronga Zoo in Sydney and a friend of mine who's a gorgeous illustrator drew this picture of a bear and I leaned over her shoulder and instantly thought, I think I can tell that bear's story. And I asked her permission. I said, would you mind if I wrote his story? And um, she said, no, no, that, that's fine. It's just a doodle, she said. And, of course, it was genius. Who, and, who was um, that? And so the illustrator's name is Marjorie Crosby Farrell. Right. And so I worked on the picture book and this whole story of this bear came to me just from this beautiful little mm. sketch in on a writer's group, you know. And then and the picture book comes out. Shall I? Can I just? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, stick it up. Bear in space. Look at that. Yeah. Cool. And the lovely thing about this. Now, if you're on, the, if you're listening on the podcast, Deb's just held up a book called <laughs> Bear in Space. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, podcasters. And but that's the thing. Like that had. You know, be with other writers as much as you can. Join um, writers' groups, do online critiquing, turn up for book clubs. Like, just be with other writers too because you can, you can see the world and discuss the world in a way that you may not with your partners or your friends because, you know, writers kind of often approach the world or talk about the world in, in different ways. So, so if, you're, if you're in year five or six, for example, how would you, how yep. would you do – how would you go about that, do you think? Oh, year five or six – I actually, when I was in a primary school, I would write stories all the time and I would have my friends who were my, you know, my friends who were my sporty friends and I had my other friends who were, I don't know, into something else. And But I'd have my friends too who were writers and they were really bookish friends and we would write stories and we actually wrote stories for each other. So I would say in year five and six, hang out with those friends um, who are writers and who kind of really like talking about ideas and talk, talk about books as well. But also definitely in year five and six, look out for your local library. Um, I know Westwards do quite a few for events, for writers' events, and they, uh, you know, when, when you actually get to meet an author and you get to kind of write and work with them but also pick their brain. So year five and six, genius time for actually just really throwing it out there and really just exploring experimenting but when you're in when you're in year five and six you you haven't got a huge amount of life experience so how do you how do you look at things that you know and then how do you go that next step to take something you know and turn it into that amazing idea well i think um even by the time you're in year five and six you've had a lot of stuff happen to you you've been places, um, you've got family, you know, you've got friends, you've got neighbours, you've got times when you were disappointed, times when you were super excited, times when you worked really, really hard at something and it didn't work <laughs> or it did work and you were great. So I, that, the other thing I would say to, to anybody, whether you're in year five or six or older or younger, is use what you know and use your past, use stuff that's happened to you, um, that moment that made you so incredibly proud um, or something that you saw and read that made you kind of want to investigate it further. So I think, you know, even as a year five and six um, year old, there's there's a lot of stuff that you can explore. And um, I, I, as an adult, I often look back to that time because I loved being in year five, in particular year six as well. It was just, I don't know why, I just found it a really exciting time. And um, I've written books where I, I look back at that time and I look back at teachers I had. Um, I look back at funny moments I had. I look back at kind of pretty grumpy teachers that I had who who I clashed with and um, so there's still a lot of stuff that you can look at that happens in your own life that you can use in your stories. You've, you, you've said in the past that you take what you know and then you, you add the question, what if? What, what do you mean by that? Yes. 
Yeah. So um, I've, I've written, in fact, I maybe could say that about nearly every book I've written. I've taken something that I know. So, um, so for example, I wrote a book called Grimsden and I basically took the idea that the world is, is changing because of climate change and then I saw a picture of the Thames barrier, which is a flood barrier just outside of London. I did a lot of research on how that barrier works, why it's there, um, and I did a lot of research about how the world is changing with climate change. And so that's the stuff of, okay, stuff that's really happening. And then I thought, well, what if I actually wrote a story where a bunch of kids live in that city, a city like London, and one day um, with increasing rainfall, um, the, the, the city just is overwhelmed by this massive flood, a permanent flood. Most people are rescued, but a couple of kids get left behind. And then you build it. You literally build it like the branches of a tree. So it starts, that trunk is all that real stuff, the real research I did about, you know, the Thames Barrier and climate change. And then all these little branches of possibilities of characters, who they are, what they want, um, what they care about, who they care about. And then the story kind of like literally develops like that. And probably if I think about all my novels, they, they probably do all start with that kind of idea. Um, I wrote a book called The Stupendously Spectacular Spelling Bee, which was all started because of my beautiful year four teacher who every Friday afternoon would hold the spelling Olympics. And it was a way to get us excited about learning our spelling words each week. And she would literally pit the boys against the girls and we would have this race to the blackboard to write words down. And so because she made it a competition, I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, I really have to beat the boys this week. And the boys the boy, were thinking the same thing. The boys thing. always won, though, didn't they? <laughs> you're funny and uh it <laughs> and so and miss gray of course she didn't mind who won of course she just really wanted us to love words and and books and spelling and so um i i remember the feeling of that i don't just remember that as a story i remember i remember the detail of that classroom and i met miss gray not so long ago and we compared notes of what i remembered as that classroom and it's funny because i said I remember the classroom being full of like curtains and there was a theatre area and there was a lounge area and it was like, it was just such an exciting classroom. And she said, oh, really? She said, because that was my first year out and we had no budget. So I grabbed an old chair that I found on the street and I had, there was a table in my dad's garage. And so in her memory, or in her reality, it was this hodgepodge of different bits of kind of gathered furniture. But for me, it was an exciting and, and really fun place. So You've got to take from your past not only the stuff that happened, but how you felt, and then you mm. add that to your characters. As someone who's uh, worked with Year 5, 6 students and, and so on, um, I think the temptation, and having been a little person myself, I think that the temptation is often just to go with the big plot, big plot idea, you know, the big explosive idea, yeah. and we forget about the, the, the feelings that go along with those things, and we need to yeah. remember those and, and gather those as we're going along. Absolutely. And, and this is the thing. If you can get your readers to care about your characters, care about when they're sad, care about when they're disappointed, uh, your readers will come with you. You then have to add an interesting plot and good things that happen. Um, but I think it's super, super, super important that your readers care about your characters, even if they're like they're bad characters and they think, oh, this, this person really needs to cop it. They care, right, what happens to that, 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 that character. Uh, the, the other thing I'd like to say, though, is so we all have lots and lots of ideas and not every idea is a novel, not every idea is a book, but the way that I kind of can know myself in a way, if, if a, an idea is worth, worth working on to take to, like, to being a novel, I've got to have three things. I've got to have really convincing, compelling characters that are really well-rounded. I've got to know stuff about them, like what do they care about, who do they care about, um, and, and what do they want. That's super important. Then I need to know where they are, and I need to know that world as if I've been there, whether it's it a fantastical... Why, why is it important to know what they want? Ah, because that drives everything. So if you know what a character wants, you will know what they will do the utmost to try and get, save or destroy. Like you will, this is the thing that will drive your plot. So, um, so you need to have, you need to have trouble in a book. That's the third thing that I was going to mention. So you need to have character setting and you need to have some kind of trouble. And the trouble that um, is, is like that character faces 
it, it's basically to do with whatever they want. So, for example, you might write a, a book about a kid who wants to win the soccer grand final. Everything in that book has to kind of run against that. So you have to create trouble um, that gets in the way of your character winning that soccer final, um, escaping from that flooded city, surviving World War II, uh, whatever it is in your book, your character has to want something. And so that's a really good thing to ask your characters as well and to keep asking as you're writing the story, well, what do my characters want? Do they still want that thing? And, and maybe they get it, but it's, it's not all they thought it was going to be, or it actually causes them trouble by getting that thing. But th what your character wants actually drives your story. The, the example I always use in this is, is Shrek. You know, he, he wants to be... He wants to be left alone and so he goes on this quest to make that happen and in the, in the process he falls in love and doesn't want to be alone anymore but he does get his swamp. So he kind of gets what he wants but he gets, it's changed a bit and so is he, which I think yes. is a, yeah, yeah. That's a great example, the Shrek one too, because that is, that is sometimes your characters don't get what they want and sometimes that's even better. Mm -hmm. But we're getting into character now, and then, but yeah, but it, it, well, but it's all it's all linked, though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. looking for ideas and and playing with characters, it's all it's all very closely linked together. None of none of this is something that you just go. Today, we're going to talk about characters. I don't want to know about ideas or setting or anything. Uh, all, yes, I guess that's <laughs> a pretty true. important message for for people to get if they're listening now. Is that even though these things are independent of each other, in a sense, yeah. they're all kind of connected, aren't they? So, yeah. um, so what what about the big ideas, little ideas that you kind of Make a differentiation between those. You, are you, how do you how do you filter them out? How do you sort them? How do you sort them? It all has to come back to: Do I need this for my plot to work? And sometimes you can think of a great scene, and I've done this, and I'm sure you've done it too, James. Like I've written, you know, a chapter that I think, ah, oh, yeah, that's a pretty good chapter. It's I'm kind of happy with how it's, you know, how it how it goes, you know, what happens, how it's written. Um, but if you, if you can cut that chapter out of that book and the plot still makes sense, then you don't need that. So well, I that think hurts. as you... That hurts to do that. Oh, my gosh, tell me about it. I, <laughs> I've written a couple of books where I've thrown out at least half the novel because mm. I've realised we don't need it or that's, that's not the story I'm trying to tell. And that's go back to what does my character want um, and sometimes I'll add other kind of, you know, secondary storylines and I just think, no, that's actually just getting in the way of my story. But you don't throw those and away, it, do you? Well, when I say throw it away, no, I mean, every I, you, single... You keep them for maybe using in a different story later. Yeah, and every single novel I write, I have an off-cuts file. That's just what I call it. So uh, anything that I cut out, and it could be, even be a really ordinary sentence, I always take it out and put it in the off-cuts file uh, for that particular novel. And I have, yeah, I have gone back and used stuff where I've thought, you know what, that didn't work in that book, but it might actually work for another problem I'm having with another character or another book that I've, I'm kind of starting to think about. So, yeah, I never, ever, ever throw anything away, but it does get just put aside if it's getting in the way of the flow and the plot of that story. I guess um, if anyone out there knows how to hack into computers remotely, there's an offcuts file on Deb's computer that's got full of all these amazing ideas that <laughs> she doesn't want to use, but the rest of us would be more than happy to use, I'm sure. Well, someone else might make a better job of it than I did, so, yeah, right. <laughs> so the other thing I've heard you say about hunting and gathering is ask questions. I know we've yes. kind of covered that, but what kind of questions? Can you give us a, a couple of questions that you would ask, you know, the, the obvious ones? Well, I think um, the, the obvious one is, yeah, so what's going on here and what's about to happen? And I think we do that often anyway as readers anyway. We're kind of thinking, oh, what's about to happen or a great film we're watching, I wonder what's going to happen next. So um, I think, yeah, just ask questions of the situation um, and, and what could happen next. And I've... So, and I think that's true with fiction and I think it's true with historical fiction. So, um, so I wrote a, a book, for example, um, called Teresa, A New Australian, and that is very grounded in something that happened to my dad. So my dad was born in a cave in a country called Malta during the middle of a bombing raid in World War II. And I've always known that story, but as I got older, I wanted... I'm, 
what? Like, what do you mean you were born in a cave and why was your country being bombed and where is Malta? And, you know, so as I got older, I just asked a lot of questions. This is not thinking this is a novel. This is just me as a human being thinking that is a really amazing way to be born. And, and after asking lots of questions about this, I thought, oh, actually, I think this could be a novel because we've got, you know, a boy um, born during the middle of this incredible period of, of World War II. This, this, his country is being bombed, and Malta was the most heavily bombed place in World War II. Um, why were they being bombed? Um, how did he survive that? How did people do normal, everyday, regular things like eat and keep clean? And where did they sleep if their house was destroyed? And the, that was a book where I think for a couple of years it was actually just me asking lots of questions and then starting to take notes. And then when I thought, I think this is a novel because characters started to kind of form in my head too, I thought, no, no, I need now to work out is this a story? Um, and then I did lots of research. I did a lot of oral history gathering. I did a lot of, you know, um, watching of archival footage from World War II. And then I realised, actually, this is a book. So I, with that book, I just... All I did for many, for a long time, for years, in fact, was just ask questions. Did you ever get answers that you didn't expect? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially when I did some oral history taking, so I sat with people now who were kind of mostly in their late 70s, 80s, um, who were kids during World War II, and I would ask them, how did you survive? Where, how did you find food? And And they would tell me the most incredible stories, you know, heroic stories, um, just ordinary stories in a typical setting, but during World War II was quite fascinating. And isn't, so... Malta the, isn't Malta the world's leading producer of Maltesers? I guess that's what, <laughs> that's what they would have eaten, right? What a place to grow up. Oh, my God. Maltesers in Malteser everywhere. land. Yeah. No, look, I, I, I hate to... Um, I hate to burst your bubble, but no, Maltesers, uh, I think, uh, come from the UK. <laughs> oh, what... So it's just olives and fish, right? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. The other thing too is, sorry, mm. I think um, just explore ideas too from different angles. Like, um, I, you know, we've met authors who said, I just couldn't, I knew I had a great idea, but I couldn't quite get it to work. And so they've been, you know, beavering away at it and trying to make it work. And it's not till they kind of look at it from a different angle. And sometimes that means, okay, it's not this person who should be telling the story. Ah, oh, this story is much more interesting if this person tells the story. Or maybe I don't set it in a, a regular world. Maybe I do send it, set it on a different planet. Or do you know what I mean? Like just, some, just the big thing I've learned in the last few years is to play. Don't be too worried about, oh, I, I think this might be a bit of an unusual idea and no one's ever going to read it. Just go with it and just play. And um, don't worry about being perfect, particularly in the beginning. It's messy. Like writing is the messiest thing that I do. You should see my house. My house generally is really tidy and that's because when I wake up every day and I, I go to my desk to write, it's a total mess. <laughs> so just play with ideas, experiment with ideas. You will throw, like we've talked about, you will throw some ideas away that are for another story perhaps or that, that aren't quite for this story. And so... Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked at a character and gone, actually, you're not the right person to tell this story and completely shifted it around? Yeah, and I've, um, I've gotten rid of characters. You know, when we talked about the pain of getting rid of chapters uh, a little bit earlier, I've, I've written a whole novel. Um, it was called The Remarkable Secret of Aurelie Bonhoeffer and there was this, this one character in it, a young teenage boy, who made me laugh. He was funny. He was sassy. He was really witty. But I actually realised that I didn't need him in the book. Like he wasn't adding anything to the book except a couple of funny moments here and there. And I liked his friendship with my main character, Orly, but I just, I knew I had to get rid of him. And when I did get rid of him, the novel was better. He was actually just meh, 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 getting in the way with his funny little lines, but he was getting in the way of stories. So um, I just, I completely got rid of him. And it, it really did change the novel because I actually thought he was one of the most important characters in this book. It turns out I didn't even need him. You have to get rid of the things that um, are, are stopping your story from being 
really either pacey or just or or just the best story it can be and it has to come back like i've been saying banging on about um what does your character want and if that if other characters or other storylines are getting in the way of that then uh then they have to go yeah it's a, the expression kill your darlings you've got to um like whole paragraphs or whole chapters sometimes yeah and you know, I think as you have more experience too, you know sometimes that, oh, you know what, that's a great, and I'm doing it even now, I do it all the time, that's a great chapter, or that's a great little paragraph, but in fact, if I get rid of it, um, we get to the point of the story, the, the, the plot moves quicker, or uh, we get to the more exciting moment um, even, even faster than we would have. And we're sort of getting into plot a little bit now, but one of the things that has... Um sort of been very popular in the last few years, certainly since you and I have been writing, is the whole idea of the twisted fairy tale or the... And I, I guess that's basically just taking... I guess you could take a story like Harry Potter and go, what would this story be like if it was told from Hermione's point of view or Absolutely. Hagrid's point of view or whatever? It's just a, it's just another another kind of idea gathering, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I've had some kids say to me sometimes, can you write that series but from... The, the other character's point of view. And it's been really such a great, tempting idea. Um, the other day I was listening to an author talk about writing too, and she said, it was Judy Bloom actually, and she said, I, either with, an, with a novel you're thinking about and you're, you're working on, get that character to write you a letter. And it can be whatever you like but um I remember I've, I've so I've got this story I'd really really like to write and I haven't started it yet but I know it so well I know the beginning the middle and the end I know this world really well and I thought okay so I sat down and write a le- wrote a letter to me as the author from this character telling me why I should write it and why she's getting a little bit cranky with me that I haven't sat down to do it yet and that actually helped me get to know that character a bit better it helped me get to know the world a bit better because she said if you don't write me I will never get to know I'll never get to meet Connor uh, you know who's going to be my best friend if you don't write this novel I will never get to match make you know the the mechanic with the florist I'll never get so she she in in explaining why I should write this book to me it, it actually helped develop not only the plot but the character and the whole thing and so it was a really fun way of looking at an idea from a different angle and I can imagine that she might have said she might potentially say something like um but you can't talk about my mum or you can't talk about this or I don't want you to cover this which immediately makes you as a writer go I definitely know what I'm going to go and look at now right (laughs) yes that's exactly right because if she's a little bit funny about talking about that well that's where your drama is right yeah and it was a really, I'm so, this is the way listening to other authors is always really, really exciting because I thought I've never done that before. I've written 26 books and I've never, I've never sat down to have a main character write a letter to me about what, what they think I've done and, or haven't done yet. So, uh, yeah, so I think looking at ideas in a different way can sometimes help you get unstuck. And a friend of mine who runs a very big company, he's not an author, he says sometimes when he's like his group his team are stuck on ideas and they might be sitting opposite each other in a chair he will get them to stand up and maybe even change chairs or even let's walk outside like he physically gets them to stand up and move out of the room or move out of that space where they feel a bit stuck and i think that's generally a a really important thing and it's like it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning go for a walk don't take your camera this time don't take even your phone because you're too tempted perhaps to look at it or answer the phone if someone calls and just look at the world from a different angle. And if, you're, if we're still under lockdown, you can't talk to anyone, so you can't get distracted either, can you? Yeah, it's good, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yes. And I have to, I've been getting on my bike a lot because that's a way to get outside and have social distancing and not touch anything except my handlebars. Um, and that's been really, really nice. Mm. Okay, Deb, well, we're coming to the end of our time. Was there anything else you wanted to quickly talk about before we wrap this up? Yeah, I think the, the big things that I would, I would want to say, because when, when I was thinking about hunting and gathering ideas, what, what do I really want to say? Um, the, the big things are, I think for me, play, be really open to new ideas and new ways of looking at those ideas. Um, don't worry about being a perfectionist. I, I've just met lots of 
um, less experienced authors like you know some kids in year five and six who say oh but I, I don't want to it's not perfect and I can't get it right and I think well that's what the editing process is about so don't worry about perfection at first just go with your heart go with ideas that make your heart really sing go exploring um and yeah and don't even you know don't worry if even if you're you know you are in year five and six and you haven't had a lot of world experience yet you've had enough to write use your past and use what you know and don't forget to give make sure your characters uh we get to know your characters and what they feel and when they're happy and sad let us get to, to know your characters inside and out mm, beautiful well thank you so much for talking to us um pleasure uh we get you get to plug your uh, your website what's what's your website deb so my website's just my name, um, deborahabella.com. So it's D-E-B-O-R-A-H-A-B-E-L-A.com. Deborahabella.com. Come for the free Maltesers, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, thanks so much for talking to us and we'll talk to you again soon. Lovely to chat, James. See you later. <laughs>